All right. Welcome back to My Jewish Learnings, Daf Yomi Week in Review. I'm Rachel Scheinerman. I edit My Jewish Learning in the Daily Dose of Talmud, and we are joined by Rabbi Asher Lopatin, who's going to steer us around the last seven days of Talmud study in Yavamot. Please go ahead and tell us in the chat who you are, where you're from, and anything else you are thinking about this week. Okay. Go ahead, Rabbi Asher. Thanks so much. Hey, everybody. Uh, so some really, actually, really interesting gems uh, I'm going to cover from, uh, well, just mention the Mishnah on 86B, uh, and then we're going to get all the way to 94A. Um, so, pay vava mukbet. And um, I'm, I'm going to do it. You know, I think sometimes when I do this, um, I've done it sort of like cliff notes, but now it's going to be more like gems from each of the dopping. Uh, and uh, you've done the hard work of uh, filling in those gems, but I just wanted to highlight some really exciting uh, parts. So first of all, you know, the Mishnah on, on 86B, Peva um, that talks really about, you know, uh, privileges that you get, that a woman gets when she marries. When she marries a Cohen, she gets to eat from the tithes. When she marries a, um, uh, a, a Levi, she gets to eat from his Maser. Um, and also uh, children give you some privileges. Um, but then we have the sad part um, that if the husband dies, um, now, so it, then she doesn't get any more. But... If she is a daughter of a Kohen and she does get, and unfortunately her husband dies or whatever, she leaves her husband, she goes back to her father. So, so it's just really interesting that relationships, the bigger idea here is really that relationships really um, count in Judaism uh, and that we're not an island basically. And so uh, um, the, uh, and, and it's also interesting that um, it's limited when you create a relationship with someone else, uh, let's say a, uh, a daughter of a Kohen who marries a Yisrael. Um, so, and then let's say he dies, unfortunately, um, it, or she goes back to her father but she can't completely break that relationship because she doesn't get the, uh, the gifts from the sacrifices that the father, the Kohen father would get when he works in the temple. Um, the chaze and shok, uh, the, the sort of the breast of the animal and the, the, the right uh, leg kind of part of it. Like, uh, so um, it's interesting that, you know, even though, it's not like your relationship is forgotten, even though it, it says with Shava El Beit Aviha, she returns to her father's home. Uh, but um, the relationship that she had is still there, at least according, at least for not being able to eat all the food that's on her father's table that comes from the sacrificial meat. Uh, interesting Rashi on, on 87A that just uh, all lechem is the term for all food. Sure, we do say a motzi lecha mina aretz just for bread, but um, and kind of specific kind of bread. But um, the um, but um, it's all um, uh, Rachel. We're getting everyone from the waiting room. I, I'm not going to touch any buttons, but uh, um, talk to. A, I don't know. I see people in the waiting room. So sorry, I'm, we're coming in. Oh, good. Welcome. Thank you. To the waiting room. Thank you. I was uh, listening with rapt attention. Yes, I'm shirking on my admission. I duty. know. I want those special bites, you know, that it, it, the lechem, which is meat also. Um, and um, it comes from Shulchan Gavoa that, you know, there's some, the truma, which the woman returning to her father's house after her relationship was ended with her husband, uh, who was not a Kohen, um, the truma it belongs to the Kohen for them to give out or they get the, the, the tithes, but the sacrificial meat that is the right of the, the, that the Kohanim get to eat, that is like from God's table. So that's a little bit different. Anyway, the bottom of 87A, I, I promised gems. I don't know if that was a gem, but uh, just the general idea of relationships. But I, interesting, um, the bottom of 87A, when it talks about a pregnant woman, 
talks about chad gufa. That's one body. Um, now, I'm not. We're not going to get into the whole abortion question here and whether uh, the the child, the fetus, is a limb of its mother or separate uber yerachimo. But it is interesting. It's an extra shade of understanding that the um, fetus is not an independent life, but is part of the woman. Again, there are all sorts of sources for this we could discuss, but I think in the current climate, when we're really thinking of abortion rights, and actually I'm working on uh, with the Muslim community coming out with a statement um, that it's interesting that even our Gemara in on the bottom of 87A weighs in and talks about Uberet is chad gufa, is one body, a pregnant woman. Um, 87B, oh yes, love it, Darche Darche Noam. I don't know if you go to a shul that's called Darche Noam. Uh, you know, we sing this uh, beautiful verse a lot. That means the ways of Torah are kind. Uh, and uh, this, according to Rashi, um, helps us interpret a pasuk in a kinder way. Um, that uh, the rabbi, it's not that, you know, Torah should be kind, so we're going to change the law, but Rashi says on, on 87A that, um, let me get it, I'm sorry, 87B, uh, that uh, really we, um, yeah, 87B, that um, it, it makes the fact that, that, that the Torah should be uh kind to a woman who has lost a child. Um, and this is about whether she, um, uh, the, the, she be, has to be part of a leverate marriage. So if there's a, with her husband, they have a child, then she's not going to have to marry the father, the deceased husband's brother. But let's say that child dies. Um, do we say, well, the deceased didn't have a child. So the um, widow has to marry uh, the the brother. Um, so, derachei adarchei noam. The idea that the Torah should be kind uh, and pleasant pushes us to reinterpret and say, well, as long as there was a child alive when the husband died, there's no issue of yibum. Um, so, um, so again. It's just so nice, you know, that's sort of the way the system works. It's an interpretive tradition, as uh, Rabbi David Hartman says, and therefore the push should be uh, should be kindness. Let's interpret in a, kindness, a kind way. Okay, so then we get the big Mishnah, the new chapter, uh, chapter 10. Uh, also, it's a terrible story, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, she marries because she thought her husband died, this is like so tragic. And then it turns out, no, um, her husband's alive. Now her husband ran away to Medina Hayam, you know, went uh, to the other side of the world or wherever. So I don't know, but you know, that sometimes happens. You have to earn money and especially people flying back and forth from Israel, you know, two weeks here, two weeks there. Um, so um, therefore um, the uh, it's a terrible case, but we get, a very important principle on 87B, and that's a echad meheman, that we can believe one witness. Um, um, that if one witness says that, yes, we saw the husband died, we trust them. And even one witness to the other and a woman to another woman. Uh, and then on, on uh, 88A, we get the uh, very important principle, Mishum Aguna Akilu Be Rabbanan. Uh, the rabbis were lenient because of a case. We don't want a woman to be stuck and anchored. Aguna uh, is like an anchored, to be anchored and not be able to marry and not have her husband around. So if, if even one witness sees, can testify that, um, that she is, um, that, she, that, that her husband had died, so then that is um, uh, reliable. Now, uh, on 88A, it also talks about the, the difference between uh, one witness or two witnesses, uh, and um, the, there's a cute uh, statement, in Israel, they laughed at a ruling 
from the Babylonian uh, scholars because they seem to say that, well, if there are uh, two witnesses, so if there's one witness that said the husband died and then the husband comes back and says, no, I'm here, then she has to divorce. And, and she had gotten married in the meantime, she has to get a divorce. But if there are two witnesses that say the husband uh, died and then she gets married and then the husband comes back, Lotate says she doesn't have to get divorced. So what? But the husband's around. So it seems, so they laughed in the, well, of course she has to get divorced. I don't care how many witnesses, if he's back, he's alive. So, um, but um, uh, it's a whole question. Maybe we don't believe this person. Maybe he's lying that he is the husband before. And they bring in even the story of Yosef where no one uh, recognizes him. So um, in um, 88B, um, um, uh, we sort of have sort of an interesting, kind of a problematic, speaking of everything should be pleasant and nice, but it talks about um, uh, two uh, women count like as one man. So I'm not going to get into that, but, you know, the rabbis try to be pleasant, but, uh, you know, these things have to be worked out and, and discussed. Um, but I want to talk about 89A because I just did a wedding uh, two weeks ago and I'm doing a wedding in a couple of weeks. And uh, we filled out a traditional ketuba. Um, and I see there are really good questions in the chat. And uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna let Rachel deal with them. And uh, all of you can answer each other, don't worry. Um, so I just did these weddings and it's so great that we, we talk about the um, reason uh, for a ketuba is uh, the reason for this marriage license is that we don't want the husband just to release, you know, divorce a woman and say, you know, marry a woman, divorce a woman the next day, marry a woman. There's responsibility. You have to pay. Now, in these cases that the Gemara in Nevamon is talking about, there's a penalty because she shouldn't have gotten remarried. She was relying on uh, not a good enough uh, evidence, but it uses those terms, mizonaychi v'chisutaychi. Uh, Rashi used those words. Those words were, uh, you know, amazingly are still in the Tuba now. So it's just incredible that this tradition uh, continues. So 89A kind of gets sidetracked with uh, Truma and all sorts of questions of tithes based on that Mishnah that um, these marriages, which were not really approved, and, and are problematic because a husband reappears, she becomes, she can't eat any more truma from the father or whatever. So, um, but we'll leave that alone. I don't want to get too much into uh, truma because on 89B, here's a bigger idea. Um, Rav Chiza talks to um, Rabbah, sent, Shalach le Rav Chiza, the Rabbah, sends Rav Chiza, ein beitin mitanin le kor davar mina Torah. Um, it has to do a lot with um, uh, responsibilities of a junior who uh, from the Torah would not be obligated or not be able to inherit. But um, aim, the, the idea that a baiting does not have the power to uh, change anything um, from the Torah. Uh, and this is sort of limiting the power uh, of of the rabbis, um, it's it's interesting. Sort of like a, somebody thought, thinking about the constitution uh, that the rabbis, uh, like a legislature. If let's say you seem think the rabbis are kind of like the legislature, or maybe like judges, cannot change anything from the Torah. It's also very interesting in the current context about the Supreme Court and originalists and all that kind of stuff and interpreting the constitution. But the amazing thing really is in this Gemara, and it really go, comes back and forth in different uh, doping that we studied, is that um, the rabbis do have power to change things from the Torah. So, you know, again, when we think about our, the U.S. Constitution, I know we have people from all over the world, but the U.S. Constitution and uh, loyalty and staying within that and, and uh, still... Uh, the Torah, you would think, is, is you know, is, as uh, powerful as the Constitution, as, as holy. Um, the rabbis start out by saying you can't change anything. But in the end, 
uh, on 89B. They talk about it a very, there are ways of changing things. One way is through hefker, baiting, hefker. Whenever it's a monetary issue, the baiting, sort of the, uh, you know, it means a court, but it's also the rabbis can sort of nullify anyone's money and sort of kind of like eminent domain um, in America we have really can, can take over, can just say that you're, you don't own this property any, anymore. It's healthcare, it's ownerless, really. So um, it is as um, powerful, uh, as, as important as the Torah is, and as you have, uh, you know, uh, Rav Chizda saying, no, you can't change the Torah. Yeah, the rabbis find ways of doing it. Um, and on uh, 89B, a really a beautiful way is the definition of a met mitzvah. Um, uh, one of these uh, marriages that are problematic and are uh, you know, not approved by the rabbis uh, talks about maybe the husband cannot bury his, a Kohen cannot bury his wife if he wasn't supposed to be married to her in the first place. But we do say midirabana mitamela that no, he can, um, and that's because. So the rabbis find a loophole. It's not that they're going against the Torah, which says a kohen cannot defile himself for someone except a legal wife or a legal relative, but kevan de lo yartela because this poor woman. Again, she got involved in a bad, in a marriage that was not really legal and turned out to be not legal. She doesn't have people, the kids don't inherit her. Um, she's considered a mate mitzvah. It's considered a, a kind of a charity case where there's no one that's obligated to bury this poor woman. So the husband, who really shouldn't have been the husband, is allowed to, uh, who's a Kohen, is allowed to defile himself, me do'oraita, which is a Torah violation to defile and such a dead body. But in this case, the rabbi says it's a met mitzvah. When it's a met mitzvah, when there's no one to bury someone, then even a Kohen, even a Kohen Gadol, the, the high priest can defile himself. So really um, a beautiful way of, you know, showing... Again, derachea darche noam the the you know the the pleasantness, the mercy, the ch- the compassion that the halacha has, not by changing the law, but by really reinterpreting and saying, hey, hey friends, this is a met mitzvah. Um, on ninety a, we get into a whole bunch of thing of of shogeg, of um, if you uh, pay a penalty to a kohen uh, in produce that is tame, that is impure, but it was by accident, it's okay, and by my mazid, if you did it on purpose, you 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 owed something to the Kohen because you misused the truma, his truma, his tithes, and you gave him uh, uh, you payment, but the stuff that you gave him was impure, and you did it on purpose, it's not valid, um, it, it's not good. Um, but then, uh, again, on 90A, um, we come closer. In the past, we said, no, the rabbis can't uh, take away a Torah law, but shave al tase shani. Um, it's different. Um, the rabbis do have the power to tell you not to do something. They don't have the power to, and we'll see later, they kind of do, but they don't, right now, uh, we're thinking you have the power to actively actively violate the Torah, but they do have the power to say, don't do something. So for instance, second day of Shavuot, if you observe that, and traditionally in the diaspora, there's a second day of Shavuot. I didn't put on tefillin. Um, Tefillin's a Torah commandment to do every day, but the rabbi said, it's kind of strange because it's only a real minhag. Rabbi say, second day, Yom Tov, want, want you to treat it like the first day, no tefillin. So that's an example of Shei Val Tas. They didn't ask me to actively violate the Torah, but they asked me not to, uh, to, stay, to be passive. Um, but then on 90B, Amr Le Rav Chizal Rabba, so Rav Chizal, again, is actually is uh, saying, you know what, sometimes they actively 
uh, do violate something. And this is based on Elijah at Mount Carmel. Remember the drama where he says uh, to the idolatrous priests, you know, you go try to get your gods to offer a sacrifice and I'm going to get my God to take a sacrifice. And this was done, Eliyahu was done on Har Carmel, let's say Haifa or somewhere, let's say that's where the Carmel Mountain is, not in Jerusalem and, and not in... Uh, yeah, not in Jerusalem. So you're not allowed, you weren't allowed. This was a time when there was a temple and he was a Jewish Israelite priest. Uh, Israelite, he was a priest, but also a prophet. He should not have been allowed to offer a, uh, a sacrifice. So um, outside of Jerusalem, but he did. And that is actively violating a Torah commandment. Uh, and, but we said, uh, you know, um, Migdar milta shani. It's different when you're doing it to make a point, to make a fence or something like that. And also that he was um, a, a prophet. So don't do this at home, but uh, this is something that, that, you know, you can, that does happen sometimes. A great rabbi or trusted prophet is able to violate a Torah, even a Torah commandment, even actively. Then we get to, I mean, this is 90B is huge. The, the uh, critical halacha, I mean, seminal halacha, um, that whenever you get married, how do the rabbis mess with the get when the person, a get that is not valid, that should be valid from the Torah, a divorce should be valid from the Torah, but they find a way of making it invalid. And that is, um, or the other way around, uh, the other way around, they make a get valid, would have been invalid. The, the, the husband sends a messenger with the get, but then in the middle he says, I don't want to get, I don't want this divorce to work. So the rabbis say, no, no, no. You sent this get with a messenger, this divorce, it's going to happen. We don't care. How do they do that? This is like allowing a woman to remarry and sleep with a, and marry another man and uh, Asian Ish is a Torah violation of the Ten Commandments. Well, um, because the rabbis have a right to retroactively say that the original marriage never happened because if you get married, you are getting married uh, on the adat with the concurrence of the rabbis. And basically, if you do something against what the rabbis wanted you to do, they can automatically take away, they could say this kiddushi never happened. How do they do that? They say that the ring that you gave to your bride was not yours. How do they do that? Well, we learned before, um, Hefker, Beitin, Hefker. The Beitin has the right to make uh, ownerless anyone's money. So they, so, you know, when I did this marriage, I want to make sure, you know, when you married, when the husband, the, the, Groom gives the bride the ring and says, is this your, did you buy this ring? Is this your ring? Does it belong to you? Yes, it does. So, um, well, if the husband 20 years later does something not, not nice, he says, I'm divorcing my wife and here's the get and I'm giving it to the messengers and then changes his mind in the middle. Um, the rabbis say that ring that you gave was not your ring. You were never married to her. Whew. This is a should be used to help with the Aguna issue, that whole issue with women, with husbands, with counselors and husbands not giving their wives a get. So uh, Rabbi Rackman, uh, many other, uh, uh, Gdolim, Simcha Weinberg, uh, said uh, that let's apply this to that case and say, if the court says you should divorce your wife, and she has a right to have a divorce again. And you say no, we'll say, oh, okay, well, you were never married to her. And then she can remarry. Very powerful reasoning. But I must say that the Orthodox establishment um, has never taken this up. Um, so re re it's really tough. I don't know. It's, it's a big, huge, giant debate. Rav Soloveitchik was so much against it. Anyway, um, we continue uh, hearing about uh, someone stoned because he was riding a horse on Shabbat. Well, riding a horse is a rabbinic prohibition, 
Uh, but um, we hear that Shamati Shabetin Makivon Shilomina Torah. Sometimes the Beitin has this power. So a lot of this is about rabbis gone wild, uh, but they're only going wild because they really, it, they care about things. Um, and I just want to point out on 90B, it talks about a, uh, a man who um, had relations with his wife under a fig tree. I don't know, very romantic, but they didn't like this. This was like public lewdness. So they whipped him, they didn't kill him, but they whipped him. But I think it's so important to point out, and I'll point out when the, 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 the Tom was being misogynistic and, uh, um, but um, this, in this case, they whipped the man. You know, that's always a case with prostitutes that they go after the prostitute. They don't go after, I think the bill, is it called the bill or whoever, the, the John, the John, sorry, the John. But um, here, um, they went after the man. So I like that. If you want to go after public lewdness, go after the men who are doing it. But, okay, sorry to all the men on this. Anyway, this will just be fair about it. Um, okay, um, 92B talks about some bad gitin, gitin that are bad, um, but um, kind of a shtach at Rome, if you wrote Rome, and Rome doesn't have a language or sort of all sorts of things. Uh, but the bottom of 91B, great uh, line, Ulakola Losham Inan. Let's say uh, the husband uh, was declared dead by a witness and then she gets married. And then someone comes along and says, No, the husband, I saw the husband, he's alive. Ulakola Losham Inan. We don't listen to rumors. We don't listen to rumors. On 90, to B says, well, that's after she gets married. But before, let's say we hear the husband die and then she's ready to get married and we hear the husband is alive. We got to pay attention to it because uh, the, the, the rumor that we trust or the testimony is only af- that we don't trust is only after she has gotten married. Um, 92 B is, you know, it's so interesting that we talked about the power of the rabbis um, and now we look at um, the limitations, the mistakes that Beitin made. One of them is that they said, oh, Shabbos is over. It's like in Detroit a lot of times where I am. Sometimes it's so dark, you don't know whether it's daytime or nighttime. So they Shabbos is over. Everyone does malacha, does work. And then suddenly they find, oh, no, we got mixed up. It's daytime, sunrise. So uh, Beitin can make mistakes. Um, great statement, Yikov Hadin et Ahar, in the middle of this, uh, of, of uh, 92b, uh, talks about sometimes Rashi says, Holchin Achar Omek Hadvarim. Sometimes you can't weasel out of a halacha and, and kind of halacha casualty. You have to go, actually, you got to do what's right. Um, uh, I want to just point out 92b, I know I have one minute, 92b, Ravmari Bar Rachel. I don't know what the story is, but he's using his mother's name. That's great. Yay. Uh, I mean, I think- Oh, there's something wrong with his father. I can't remember what it is, but oh, there's a reason we don't you. like to name him by his father. If, if you know, put it in the chat. I think his father was <laughs> um, a soldier, a convert, God forbid. I don't, I don't remember. Okay, good, good. I'm sorry. I will, I will look it up. Oh, and I will see you. if I can look it up in the final minute. Great. great. So um, then when we get to um, 93 a um this great concept of davar shalom bala olam not something that's not around yet can you you know betroth your wife on it based on a condition a tonight about something that hasn't happened yet it's all discussion but i love this idea that rabbi akiva says rabbi akiva dafka adam makna davar shalom bala olam a person can uh, uh, make someone acquire something even that hasn't come into the world. Remember, Rabbi Akiva is the messianic rabbi. He's the one that supported Bar Kochva. He's the dreamer. He's the one, you know, that is willing to go against the whole Roman Empire. So he, of course, believes that a davar shalom bala olam, like the dream of Medinat Yisrael, of the Jewish state, uh, it's real. It's real. Um, and finally, on 93b, uh, there are a lot of things that are allowed mitzum oneg Shabbos because of uh, enjoying Shabbos. Uh, that's a very important uh, um, 
uh, practical matter. 93b, great point. Milta Davida Ligluya Loma Shaker. Uh, some have the theory that if, if something is going to be found out, people won't lie about it. So that's an interesting rule. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, uh, I, um, it, today's DAF, 94, you're going to get to uh, hear about Rea Haget, Kahuna, someone who gives his wife a half of a get, basically, and then dies. Oi, she still kind of can't marry a Kohen. And then you're going to look at who gets burnt uh, when doing bad things, illicit relationships. But again, it's an equal opportunity doff. But Aishi, Sifu, Otov, and both of them get burned. So that's a great place to end. Uh, and, uh, you know, God willing, we'll, be, uh, we'll feel the fire of Torah, all the good fire of Torah, and mm-hmm. not the singeing of Torah. I mean, Stella. Okay, thank you so much, Rabbi Lopat. And that was quite a lot you packed into that half hour. Thank you all of you for the spirited um, conversation in the chat and the responses. Um, I'm going to take just a minute to finish up a tiny bit of business from a previous class because it's come up a couple of times in the chat. So we, my, if, if you were in the virginity in the Talmud class last week and are interested in Rebecca Kamholtz's dissertation, which I believe I verbally promised to send around, that was an overpromise on my part. We don't have the permissions to mail that out um, we're, because it's it's intellectual property, but she is very happy to share it with you. So please just, if you were in that class and you would like uh, Rebecca Campbell's dissertation, please email me, rshinerman at myjewishlearning.com. Um, I'm going to put that in the chat as well right now. Here it is, my email address. And I will be happy to send it person to person to you that we can do. Thank you, Rabbi Lopatin. For all of this. Thank you to all of you for being such engaged learners and being with us again on this Thursday morning. And we will see all of you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rachel.